Okay, so let's get started. My name is Andrew Walker and I'm the CEO of the SA Property Investors Network, which is a like-minded platform for property entrepreneurs throughout South Africa encouraging encouraging them to do property. And that's why we that's why that's why we work closely with Tough because Tough are out there to encourage, to educate, and to help finance property entrepreneurs out in the South African space. Um, and today is all about interest rates and financing because think about it, coming through COVID and how the banks are going to be looking at us as property investors. I'm an investor myself investing and when I think about it, there's different there's different aspects as to what a bank would look like. And I've got a few questions for Henry around the banks, around financing and what do we think is going to be changing? For example, you know, as a property investor, should you be thinking about higher vacancy rates, for example? And these are some of the questions I want to be asking Homoto and Henry. So please get pen, paper, get a cup, a cup of coffee. Make sure you take loads of notes because today is going to be a very, very important day for you. Um, if you are a property investor and you're going to be buying your next property investment or you just want to understand interest rates, if you just want to understand how will the banks be looking or, or what may be changing with how the banks are looking at us. So without further ado, um, I'm actually going to ask our guests to introduce themselves. So let's start with Henry. Henry, go first. Thank you, Andrew, for another interesting session that we're going to have uh, today. And we're going to be focusing on interest rate and what funders look at when yes. they want to finance your properties. Those five C's of credit, yes. they, are, they are actually very critical. Just by way of background, I come from an investment banking background uh, with Standard Bank, with APSA, and I've been involved with the TPPE, uh, which is a program between uh, TAF and, and, and the University of Cape Town, Professor Francis Veruli. And one of the things that we always talk about is how do we finance Real estate, and that's yes. what we're going to be doing. Absolutely brilliant. And we've got an awesome guest today, Homoto. How's it going, brother? <laughs> now, Homoto, I want to know more about you. What's your background and why are you with us today? Thank you so much and greetings to you, Andrew. Thank you. My background is very much similar to Henry. I have an investment banking background. I started my career at Standard Bank, Investment Bank, Corporate Bank. Excellent. I was on the Treasury Derivatives Desk doing interest rate structuring and sales. I did that for about four years. Then I felt, you know, I wanted to have a broader banking experience. So I transitioned to Goldman Sachs International. I spent just under two years there in their corporate finance team, cool. looking at mergers and acquisitions and structuring of transactions uh, cross border and in South Africa. Okay, brilliant. And then I guess the reason I'm here is after that, I moved over into a family property business. Excellent. We do primarily peri-urban rural developments. So townships, rural areas, outlying towns, but we've also expanded. We also do residential developments now, looking mostly at residential rental markets, and we're also slowly building up our industrial portfolio. So quite a broad exposure to the sure. real estate sector. So you've been in the sector for some time then, right? Yes. I've kind of, to date, she was, I'm, I'm giving away my age here. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look like it, but I've been in the real estate space for about seven years now. Yeah. And you know his dad, don't you? I know his dad very well. <laughs> um, I actually knew Komoso's dad before him. Okay. Because he was my friend. <laughs> oh, interesting. And then later he then introduced me and said, tell you what, my son is actually working for ACMB those days. And I met Komoso and oh. we've been friends since then. Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. So now, before we get into, you know, I'm going to be asking Henry about the history of interest rates and I'm going to be asking Homozo about fixing interest rates and all that. But let's just go back to basics because it's very important that we understand the terminology around certain things. For example, um, could you just, if there's anyone watching this that, that doesn't understand what is the internal rate of return, for example, could you maybe just explain that to us? So I think it's important to understand where that comes from and when we're thinking about the internal rate of return it's essentially a measure of profitability of an investment sure so in the market there's different ways that people use these terms some people will say return on investment some people would say what's your initial yield your building yield some people will say what's a cap rate and then traditionally the banks and the investors focus more on irr internal rate of return just to sum it up quickly a cap rate, if we describe it, is really a ratio of your one year's in in income divided by the cost of the investment. Whereas a building yield is the same thing. However, 
a cap rate is market driven. It's not necessarily specific to one property. So we'd take an example. If we said, what is a commercial office building trading at in Santon? That cap rate is specifically for commercial in that Santon area. Whereas perhaps if you looked at the discovery building and had an initial yield, that return is just for that specific building. So fundamentally, that's your return for one year. Sure. The IRR takes it a bit further. That is effectively a measure of the return on income earned over a specific period against your investment upfront. So similar to an initial yield, similar to a cap rate. However, the IRR is measured over a specific period, be it three years, five years, and it can even go further and measure the return on your total investment mm -hmm. or just the equity you invested. So you can have an IRR on capital, which is everything you've invested, yeah. <clears throat> or you can have an IRR on just your equity portion in your investment. 100%. And we're, and we're talking about it. it's very important that as investors, when we do invest in real estate, that we take all the costs into consideration. And that's what you were saying earlier, Henry, about interest, right? And, and, and what important part that plays. You know what, Andrew? If you look at a geared uh, property portfolio or a geared property, your biggest expense is interest rate. Yeah. Now, if you take off the interest rate, all of us, we will be smiling. Yeah. But one needs to ensure that we manage that interest rate judiciously. Yes. Right. And we need to understand where we are mm -hmm. in this interest rate environment because it's a major component or one of the biggest expense on a, on, on a leveraged uh, property. Absolutely. We're going to talk more about that later on, Henry. I'm um, just coming back to you, Homot. So th thanks for explaining that, by the way. Let's look at the debt service cover ratio because that comes up quite often. And often people ask me about it and I don't understand it. How would you explain it to someone that's never heard about the debt service cover ratio? How would you explain it? So the simplest way to understand the debt service cover ratio is it's the amount of headroom you have before you start sinking. Okay. So it's, and I like to think of it as, how am I treading water? Am I sinking, am I paddling, or am I swimming sweep, sweep, yeah. you know, swimmingly? Absolutely. And the easiest formula for it is, you take your operating income. Some of us call it net income, you know, some of us call it EBITDA, but all we're talking about really is your gross expenses, less your vacancies, less your expenses, that gives you your operating income. Yeah, your, your income that's ge generated from your business, from your property. Then you divide that by the sum of your interest payments plus your principal. Okay. So I think all of us, you know, if you have a mortgage, you would just call that your installment. But that is your interest payments plus your principal. And the easy way to think about it is, if your debt service cover ratio is one point two. Yeah. So your operating income divided by your debt installments is 1.2. It effectively means you have 20% more operating income yep. than what you have to incur when you service your debt. So you're swimming comfortably. Okay. But if your debt service cover ratio is 1.05, you only have 5% more. So things are a bit tight. Okay, so it's very important that people do understand that. Yes. And just also, when you're doing that calculation, yep. right, you need to ensure that uh, those amounts are annualized. Yes. We, we often find that a lot of people work it on, a, on monthly and then they look and then they say, but this thing doesn't work. Yeah. So we want to make sure that uh, when you're doing this, these key financial performance indicators, you annualize those amounts. Absolutely. Okay. And the one thing I want to ask both of you to get your opinion, how would you explain hedging to someone? Why is hedging important? Look, you know what they always say, and yeah. it's hedging is basically protecting oneself from any volatility in interest rate movement. Sure. And I always give this example to say, when, 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 when does one hedge? It's like, when do you insure your house? Yeah. Do you insure your house when the flames are coming through the door? <laughs> and then you, you phone your insurance broker. Yes, they're going to insure that, but they'll just check how much is the house worth. And they'll say to you, Andrew, we can insure your beautiful house, but please deposit 3.5 million into the account. <laughs> so when everything is fine, 
that's the time for hedge. for you to actually hedge. Maybe Komoto might yeah, want what, just to expand on view? that. I certainly agree. I think Henry hit it on the nail there to say that hedging is essentially similar to an insurance policy. You know, in finance, we understand that not all risk is bad, but you must take risk if you're getting compensated for it. Sure. So essentially what hedging does is it allows you to manage a risk that you don't want or a risk that is not necessarily core to your business. And hence, it's similar to an insurance policy. Absolutely. Awesome. Anything else on that? Look, it's always important, yeah. especially for our entrepreneurs, to be able to understand mm. when is the time to actually to hedge. hedge. Mm. And that's, that's actually very important. And I think we're going to be looking at where the interest rates are vis-a-vis yeah. uh, uh, -vis over the past yeah. uh, 50 years. Uh, and, and, and I, Absolutely. I think now's the time to talk about that because, you know, we are, we can't say we're at record lows, right? Because Prime has been less than 7%. Is that right, gents? Uh, look, Prime, the lowest, um, the, the lowest Prime rate was in 1959. Yes. So when it was uh, uh, four and a half percent. Four and a half percent. Four and a half percent. Yes. yes. Wow. But that was 1959, <laughs> Andrew. Yeah, I wasn't <laughs> born yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's only some of us who are younger for longer who remember that. Sure. <laughs> so, so I think take us through that history then, right, of, the, of, of interest rates. So basically, in, in, like what did I say, 1959, that was the lowest uh, uh, prime interest rate at 4.5%. And I think for some of you who are listening, you recall 1998, when prime interest rate went to 25%. 25%. I think that's when a lot of people were knocked out the market. Very much so. Yeah. And that was because of the Asian crisis. Yeah. Right. So prime went to 25%. Um, and, you know, at that time, everybody was saying prime is actually coming down. Yes. Right? And what happened? It went to 25%. But if you look at where prime is, right, it's at 7%, yeah. which is a 40-year law. Yeah. So, you know, let's take the advantage. Because, I mean, um, I think, Komoto, you've never seen Prime at 7%. No, certainly at first. <laughs> certainly at first. <laughs> and I think, you know, we're using the word Prime. So someone came to the other day and they're a bit confused about the difference between what's the repo rate and what is Prime. Maybe, Komoto, explain the difference. So in the economy, there's what we call the repo rate or fully expanded the repurchase rate. The repo rate is the rate at which the central bank or the reserve bank lends to commercial entities or otherwise called commercial banks or yep. pension funds. But it is the rate that the central bank uses to control inflation. Yeah. And how it does that is by increasing the repo rate, yeah. you're effectively allowing credit extension in the market. There's more liquidity to the banks and therefore that liquidity passes on to the retail and commercial markets. Sure. By decreasing the repo rate, you're effectively taking liquidity out of the market and slowing down the availability of credit to the economy. Sure. So it's a mechanism for monetary policy control. Okay. So we call it the benchmark backstop lending rate. Okay. Prime is essentially the rate at which banks lend to retail clients. Like, like myself, ourselves. like yeah. you. Yeah. Exactly. Or to other small businesses. However, it's important to remember that it's actually a benchmark rate. Okay. So it's not a live commercial rate similar to what we might call JIBO. Yeah. There's a rate in the market which is very important called three-month JIBO. And what's that? That's essentially the rate at which banks lend or trade money between themselves. So APSA to APSA, APSA to another AAA rated entity, call it uh, Anglo-American. They would all borrow and, and lend to each other at three-month JIBO. Okay then Prime is a spread above repo. Historically, it's been about 3.5% above the repurchase rate, and it's been quite static over the last 20 years. And it's also a spread above three-month JIBO. Okay. But it's important to remember, even though Prime is a rate that banks lend to retail clients, it's really just a benchmark rate. When the banks think about how do they price your loan, they price it off 
three month JABA. So it's a spread about three month JABA. Yeah. But when they're quoted to you, which is what we all see when we get our home loans, they always quote prime plus, prime minus. Always important to remember that's not necessarily to say the pricing of that loan is based on prime. It's just a benchmark. Sure. Andrew, just for the tough clients yep. that are watching or listening to this uh, uh, session. So tough. When they are funding these entrepreneurs, okay. they use the prime overdraft rate. Okay. So currently, prime is at, is at 7%. Yep. But remember, that's the base rate yes. that they use. And then they add a margin over, over and above that. Sure. But the basis for calculating your funding is the prime overdraft rate. Okay. So it's important for them to realize where prime is. Yeah. And at 7%, this is the lowest that has been yes. in the last 40 years. Absolutely. And I think a very common question that I'm, that I'm certainly getting, I'm, sh I'm sure you're asking yourself the same question is, so interest rates are low, 7%, and, there, and there's great opportunity with that, gents. But the question is, when will interest rates start going up and how quick will they go up and will they get back to 9 10 11%? And, you know, being a property entrepreneur myself and, and investing in this market, should I be running my numbers on 7% or should I be a bit more conservative and say, yes, for the next few years, interest rates may be 7, 7.5, maybe 8, but should I be running my numbers on 10%? How conservative should we, should we be as investors in this market, Homozo? I think perhaps the first place to start, and I'll go back to what I talked about with three-month Java. When we're thinking about where interest rates are going to go to in the short term or the medium term. We take our guidance from one, the Monetary Policy Committee. They meet every two months and they set what's happening with the repo rate. But in those speeches, they typically give a fairly detailed guideline as to what they expect to happen in the economy in the short term. Okay. For example, in the last meeting, they gave a guideline that even though inflation is at the bottom of the target band, you know, in South yes. Africa, we yeah. have a mandate to keep our inflation rate between three and six percent. Yeah. And I think they're saying that they're estimating that for 2020 is going to average around 3.2 percent. Okay. So at the bottom of the band. However, they did say that they're expecting that in the thir third and fourth quarter of 2021, yeah. there might be a 25 basis point increase in each quarter. Okay. So basically interest rates in 2021 might increase by half a percent. Okay. So that's the first guidance we get. The next one is we look at this rate called three month JIBA. Yeah. It's a market rate. And remember we said that it's how the banks trade money between each other. And what they then do is they have what they call a market yield curve, which is a estimate of, which effectively is a forward estimate of where interest rates are gonna go, but it's based on three month JIBA. So that curve will tell you that basically we're thinking that in a year, this is where the average of those three month JIBA resets will be. And the traders in the bank will call that a one year swap. Yeah. It's called a swap rate. Okay. And likewise, they'll do that for two years, you'll have a two year swap. They'll do that for three years, they call that a three year swap. But all that is, is it's an estimate of where this three month JIBA will reset every yeah. quarter yeah. for that period. Interesting. So it gives you an indication. For example, three month JIBA right now is at 3.34%. So okay. it's actually lower than repo. <laughs> Something to indicate that. Remember we said yes. three month JIBA is a market rate. So it moves yeah. based on what's happening in the market. Sure. It's actually at 3.34% now, but your, I think your two year and three year swaps should be around 4%. Okay. What is that telling us? On average, the market is saying over two years, three month JIBA will have increased <laughs> to around 4%, okay. which is showing us potentially what could happen to short-term interest rates over that two-year period, over that three-year period. So really, just to sum it up, we take our guidance from the MPC, yep. economic data, but we also look at the market rates, sure. which is your three-month JIBA and your swap rates. So with the MPC, I mean, it's important that as investors, we follow that, that guidance and information. Where can we get our hands on that information? Typically, the it, you can get publications. Yeah. Um, they publish the speeches online, also from the Reserve Bank. Most of the banks also publish market rates. For example, RMB, Standard Bank, EPSA. Yeah. They all have a fixed income market rate section, which will tell you where 
three month Jabo is, where one year swaps are, where two year swaps, where three year swaps. It's all publicly inf available information. Fantastic. Henry, so, any comments on that? So, Andrew, having looked at that, as an entrepreneur, yeah. when you're looking at financing your, 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 your property, yes. you also need to run what is called a sensitivity analysis. Right. Now, you need to say to yourself, what would be the base case? Yeah. Right. It's where we are. What is the worst case? Yeah. Let's say interest rate goes to 10%. If your project works at a higher interest rate, right, then you are being conservative. So you are not going to be caught napping when interest rate, when prime moves back to 10%. Yeah. So always run this sensitivity analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Always run this because it helps you. And you want to make sure that your project works at the worst case scenario. Exactly. Yes. And even if it takes a few years for interest rates to go up, at least you're benefiting them off the low interest rates. Now, Komoto, my friend over here, has actually got a magic ball. So can you tell us when are interest rates <laughs> getting back to 10%? <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, I come from a markets background, so I take my cue from what's happening in the market. Yep. And it looks like at the moment there might be a hike in 2021. Although that is not cast in stone because it's not a crystal ball. But if we're looking at where the market is saying, it looks like over the next two, three years, we might have on average about another 150 basis points hike, which is 1.5% above where we are at the moment. Brilliant. Okay, excellent. So what I want to start doing now is uh, we've spoken quite a bit about interest rates. So the next thing I want to start talking about is the financing and the five C's we spoke about. So Henry, like I said, let's start talking about financing and what and, and what do the banks look like? And I was talking to Henry this morning and, you know, very interesting. Have you all heard of the five C's? And if you haven't heard of the five C's, get pen and paper and make sure you write this down. It's very interesting. So obviously we've come through COVID now, Henry. And look, I'm going to make the assumption that the banks are going to be maybe a bit more conservative. So take us through the five C's and really explain what are they about. So Andrew, the funders, look at what we call the five C's of credit. Okay. So the first C, is your capacity. Okay. Capacity to repay the loan. But I'm going to go back and, and explain further. Sure. Then you need, the second C is capital. You need to have some equity. Some skin in the game. You need to have some skin in the game. Okay. Very much so. Sure. Uh, then the third C is the character. Who are we lending to? Yeah. And a lot of uh, the tough entrepreneurs, I mean, we know them. Sure. You know, these are entrepreneurs. These are the guys that walk the streets and they need to understand the character of the borrower. Sure. Then you also need to look at uh, what are the prevailing conditions. Sure. And I think Komoso is touched on interest rate. Sure. What has COVID done to real estate as an investment class? Yes. <laughs> right. These are all the conditions that we need to be looking at. Sure. And last but not least, it's about collateral. Yes. Right. Now, as a funder, you want to make sure that you have what is called a first mortgage bond over the property. You yes. need to have security over the property. Okay. You also want to have, you know, what you call session of insurance, session of uh, rentals, and all these form part of the security that the lender will require for them to actually fund. Sure. But Andrew, let's just go back yes. to that capacity. This is about serviceability of, of debt. This is about cash flow. Sure. Remember, you have heard of this. Cash flow is key, especially <laughs> in, in this market. Tough market. You know, yes. in this tough market, if you've got cash, you know what? You are the key. Sure. So one thing that Komoso spoke about yeah. is that uh, debt service cover ratio. Sure. Right? So your cash flow, you want to make sure that uh, uh, your debt service cover ratio is actually at 1.3 to 1. Okay. Right? So in other words, what you are paying back, yep. right, is almost uh, between, is 30% more. And why is this important, Andrew? Remember what has been happening. Yeah. There was COVID. The vacancies have increased, yeah. right? And the municipalities, we have seen what has been happening over the last five years with their increases. Sure. Now, if let's say you have a project that is... A, at, at, at a debt service cover ratio of one to one. 
Yeah. And then the municipality then increases uh, the the municipal account. Yes. Uh, by you know it's it's more than uh, uh, inflation. Six to eight percent. Six to eight yeah. <laughs> percent. So it means that you haven't got enough cash flow. That's why you need to have that buffer. Absolutely. So it's about cash flow, serviceability of debt. Yes. That is a capacity. Sure. Then you also need to look at uh, the capital. By capital, you need to have some form of equity. Yes. Like what you have said, sure. you need to have skin in the game. Absolutely. You need to have something. But what is interesting, as tough, right, for those, some of you who are listening, right, uh, yes, there is, there is need to be skin in the game. And with tough, they normally look at equity injection yeah. of, of about, call it 20%. Yeah. So if you have got a project a total development cost of 10 million, yeah. so your equity requirement is going to be 2 million. Yeah. But a number of us, you know, uh, we haven't got the equity. Sure. And equity is a scarce resource. Exactly. But TAF have got this, what is called the into Tuco equity fund. Yes, I've where, heard about Yes, this. where yeah. they can actually assist you to cushion you so that the project works. So for those entrepreneurs, right, yeah. you need to have some skin in the game. But if you haven't got that sufficient equity, sure. please go and speak to TAF about the, Intutuko about the Intutuko equity fund. And how does the interest work there with, 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 a, with a specific fund? So, so basically with the Intutuko, it works. Uh, so let's say uh, you only have 10% uh, equity. Okay. Into Tuko will come with the other 10%. Sure. And the Into Tuko funding is actually at uh, 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 prime, um, I, th I think it's currently at prime minus, uh, minus two. Oh, okay. But you need to pay this sure. um, over the next uh, seven years. Okay. So the tough loan, the tough term, maybe more like a 15 year period plus minus. Is that right? Yeah, Where yes. Is that it's, it's, yeah. So basically, so basically the way this is going to work is you have got your equity. Yeah. Then you have got into Tuco, which will be paid over a seven year uh, period. Yeah. And then you've got this, the, the tough senior debt. Yes. Which is traditionally over a 15 year term. Okay. So you've got equity, you've got into Tuco seven years, and then you've got tough loan, which is at uh, the beauty of this, right? Is that this is not mezzanine finance. Right. Typically, your mezzanine finance is higher. Yes. But TAF is saying, come with us. We will give you into Tuko. Exactly. We will make things happen. And we'll guide you along we the way. We are going to guide you along the way. That's yeah. why we've got this mentorship. We've Absolutely. got the training. And that's why we've got these webinars. Exactly. So <laughs> that you as a client can understand. Yes. Because up to the end of the day. Absolutely. We want you to be successful entrepreneurs. We want you to be able to leave real estate. Absolutely. That's yeah. the whole point. Andrew, you know that uh, of all millionaires worldwide, 90% of those millionaires made their money in real estate. Absolutely. And I know you are one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and my friends over here. <laughs> And, and tell me, with the coming back to the five C's, because the important we go through all of them, right? Yes. So with the capacity, the capacity to repay that loan, what do the other four C's? So, so basically, we've looked at the capacity, yeah. right? We have looked at the at capital, where you need to inject some equity. And we have said, if you haven't got enough equity, into Tuko can come in. Yes. Then there is the character. Who are we lending to? Right? Are we lending to Komozo? I mean, I look at Komozo, can we trust him? Uh, you know, we, we have sure. gone through this COVID, right? Yes. But has he been able to tell us what is happening in his building? Sure. Right? So that is correct. So it's not just the computer saying yes or no. It's more about what experience have you got? Where do you come from? What's your plan? What's your exit strategy? Who's your team? It's understanding not just Komozo, but who's around him. And how is he going to take on this project? Very much so. so. And also, we need to understand is Komozo managing his portfolio or is he outsourcing his portfolio? Sure. Right. So that, that's, that, that's also very critical. Big time. So we, we, we have now looked at the character. And then we need to understand the conditions. 
Yes. All right. What is happening with the condition? What's happening with the interest rate? We've mentioned interest rate at 40, at 40 year, prime at 40 year low. How has COVID right, changed the game yes. when it comes to uh, a rental of residential properties? And if you look at these stats that are coming out, you know, the unemployment figures, uh, over uh, uh, 4 million people that are unemployed. Yes. How is this going to impact, yeah. right, uh, serviceability of debt? Sure. So you need to understand those conditions. What is happening with the CBDs, yeah. right? The good areas, the bad areas, the exactly. development, what's, what's the plans for that specific area? Because I've done some research recently across South Africa, um, generally speaking, in a lot of areas, not all the areas, but there's a lot of areas where you saw this on, if you take a 10 year view and you look at the conditions of that area where it was climbing, plateauing, a lot of areas are, are starting to dip. Mm -hmm. So it's important to understand what type of area and not just buying the building because the numbers look good. It's very important that you look at that suburb, that town, that city, that area and understand what's going on. Would you agree with that? Very much so. And also, if you look at it, um, and why TAF has been funding in the CBDs? I mean, traditionally, the, feed, the CBDs have got all the infrastructure. Exactly. They've got all the, all, all the amenities, yeah. right? And the people are there. Yeah. And the people always are busy. <laughs> the, the, it's always busy. That's a captive market. Yes. So you need to understand what is happening in the environment. Right. Be the tenants, be the interest rate, be COVID, and all those things. Sure. Try to understand. Because this has got an impact in terms of your serviceability. Remember, yes. it's about serviceability. Absolutely. It's about, you know, paying back the money. Yes. Andrew? People that, forget about that. Eh? Yeah, they like to take money, but they don't understand <laughs> they've got to pay it back. <laughs> you, you know what I always say? Yeah. You know, when it comes to borrowing money, yes. it's like a wedding. We are all happy. Yeah. We are all smiling. <laughs> when it comes to repaying the, the money, it's like a funeral. <laughs> we are all crying. Yeah, yeah. So let's think of that. Sure. Right. Lastly, it's about the collateral. Right. Yes. You know, banks need to be, and funders, they need to be secured. Sure. So you find that when you go to TAF, they will go and register a mortgage bond over the property. Yes. They are going to ask for a session of your insurance. Sure. Right. They are going to ask for session of your shareholders' loans. Yes. They are going to ask for session of rentals, yeah. right? And this helps, right? So that if there is something, uh, they can have those what you call stepping rights. Yeah. Right? And be able to collect and ensure that they are able to service that loan. So exactly. that those five, uh, five C's of credit are important. If I may just reiterate, or, or yes. to, so it's about capacity, right? Yeah. It's, it's about the capital. Yeah. In other words, skin the, in the game. Skin in the game. Yeah. It's about the character. Yeah. Who are we lending to? Who's the jockey? Who is the jockey? Yeah. Yes. And it's about the condition. What is happening with the condition? What sure. is happening in the market? Absolutely. And lastly, it's about the collateral. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I, I always find a lot of people saying, you know what, when I go and want to borrow money, I'm going to be asked to sign surety ship. Yeah. What is surety ship? That's commitment. Yeah. So if you are not prepared to commit, yes. But you want the funder, yes. To, to commit yeah. to you. And you want the money. You want and the profits. You want the money. Right. <laughs> you can't have your cake and eat it. Is exactly. What you're yeah. So there has to be quick pro quo. Brilliant. Now I was going to talk to you about terms, and we kind of touched on terms already, didn't we? We spoke about the seven-year term and the fifteen-year term. Is there anything else you want to talk about around the terms? So, so, so basically, your funding is traditionally a fifteen-year term. Sure. Right. With, uh, with uh, tough. With yes, with, with 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 tough. So that fifteen years is what you call self-amortizing. So it starts from, let's say your debt is 10 million, it amortizes to zero over 15 years. Sure. Right. Um, you also find that with your traditional banks, right, they normally have a facility where you've got a residual. Yes. Right. So in other words, they'll say, we'll give you a five-year term, yes. right, where there's going to be a 50% residual. So after five years, they then renegotiate or roll over that facility. Yeah. But with TAF, 
it's, it's, it amortizes over the long term, and that term is tradition. It's, it's, it's a 15 year term. Exactly. So you pay it off, you pay tough the money back, seven years, Ututuko, in I Tutuko, guess, paid, yes, off, yeah. paid off, and then the investor owns the assets. The investor then begins to smile. So it's just five years of being married, eh? <laughs> 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 there we go. The one question I wanted to ask Hamoto earlier was around interest rates and, and talking about how do you actually fix an interest rate? It's something that's becoming more and more commonly asked because of the low interest rates and the fear of interest rates going up. So let's just have that conversation also about how does it actually work in the back end of a bank? What do they need to do to fix those interest rates? How easy is it to fix interest rates? So maybe just tell us more about what you know about that. Okay. So I think essentially it's important to understand that interest rate hedging has different instruments available to it. There's hedging for very short-term periods and there's hedging for longer-term periods. Yep. If you're hedging anything under a year, the typical instrument you'd use is what's called a FRA, a forward rate agreement. And it essentially is, all it would be saying is perhaps you want to hedge for six months. And it would be, you'd be saying, what do we think as the market, the in short-term interest rate, three-month JABA, we spoke about it right. earlier in our discussion, will be in the next three months and the three months after that. Yeah. And then you get an average for six months. And that fixed rate average would be your hedge, your fixed rate hedge for the six month period. Okay. If we move to longer periods, if we're talking about anything over a year, in the local market, you can hedge very easily one year to 10 years. For longer than 10 years, it gets a bit more illiquid and it's just the nature of the market, the depth sure. of the liquidity in the longer terms. But in theory, you could hedge up to 15 years. But essentially what we see in the market is, and it's also very common with your example, your bigger listed yes. funds, yeah. where for them, going back to the principle of hedging, that it's removing the risk that you aren't compensated for. Sure. And I use the example of the listed funds or income funds because their mandate to shareholders is provide certainty of income. Yeah. Yes. So therefore, by hedging, they're minimizing anything that sure. will jeopardize that. Yeah. So what you'll see with them is they'll typically say perhaps they've borrowed from one of the big four banks um, or, you know, um, any other institution for, let's say, 10 years yeah. amortizing. But then what they might do is they might only hedge for five years. So on that loan profile, only five years worth of the interest rate exposure is hedged. Yeah. And that is how you think about it, because you don't necessarily need to match your interest rate hedge to the term of your loan. Yeah. You match your interest rate hedge to your risk management strategy or your philosophy about how you want to manage this risk that you're trying to mitigate. Sure. So that's really the different instruments that are available. Okay. Short term, it's the FRAs, forward rate agreements. Yeah. Long term, it's interest rate swaps. Sure. You do also have things like option hedging. Yeah. And I won't go into too much detail, but Option hedging is fundamentally like insurance. So sure. you pay a premium upfront so that we take an example today, Prime is at 7%, 7 and we could maybe perhaps if Henry and I were hedging, we'd say, well, we think that, like I mentioned earlier, interest rates might increase by 1.5% in the next, in the medium term. So we don't want to be exposed to any increases over half a percent. Sure. So we say we want to, have a head, an option, such that if interest rates go above 7.5%, yep. we are protected. Okay. And if, if interest rates are below 7.5%, we get to participate in the low floating rate environment. And for that, you pay a premium. Sure. So very much like insurance. Yeah. You're paying for protection. Okay. Those are very more advanced instruments, but the, more, the ones that are very common in the market is FRAs and swaps. Yeah. And if we talk about what happens when you approach the bank and you say, I want to hedge my loan. You've got a 15-year loan from Tuff, yep. 10 million Rand. And you come and you say, Tuff, I want to fix this loan. You have different options. If you are borrowing from a bank, everything could happen within the bank. Yep. But now because let's say we've borrowed from Tuff, I'm Khomutza, I've borrowed 10 million Rand from Tuff. I could approach one of the big four banks and say, bank, I've got this 15-year facility for, for um, 10 million rand, but I want to hedge 100% of it 
for five years. Yep. So what are we saying? We want to have a 10-year hedge, I mean, a, a five-year five year hedge, hedge for 10 million rand <clears throat> yep. for only a portion of the term, which is yep. just the five years. Yeah. What the bank then does is, in the background, they remember the banks trade in the markets. Yeah. And what they would have to do is they would have to go and basically give you that facility whereby you would pay them fixed and they would pay you the floating rate. Okay. So for simplicity, we're, we're talking about Prime here, but you know, it gets a bit more complicated where the hedges can be done on Jibar and Prime. So it's very important to always go back to the distant, the differences in those rates. There's three month Jibar, a market yield that's used by the banks, and there's Prime, which is a benchmark rate that is mostly for us as, as, as retail clients. But what they would then do is, they would say, we will pay you your 7%. Yep. That 7% you used to pay uh, tough. And then you pay us a fixed interest rate. Sure. So it's effectively a completely separate contract to what you have with tough. Yep. It's a contract between me as the borrower and the and, bank. Yep. And it's only for five years. So it fundamentally does not affect My the position. contract that you have with tough. Yep. Now, if you're doing it with a bank whereby you also borrowed for the, from the bank, using an example where maybe that 15-year facility was with the, with the bank, then effectively what the bank is doing is it's doing it all at the same time in the background. And you would then just see a fixed rate that yes. you have to pay to the bank. Yep. It's very important to remember that because the two are two separate contracts, there's the loan documentation, which is a loan contract, and there's the hedge contract. Yeah. The hedge contract has what we call a mark to market. Yeah. And you can imagine, so if I've entered into this contract with you as the bank and I'm paying you, let's say, 7.5% and you're paying me, and that's fixed. Yeah. So that's the fixed yes. rate. Yeah. You're paying me uh, the 7% prime, which I use to pay my, lend, my, my, my lender. Yeah. Now, if interest rates increase what's happened i'm benefiting yep i'm in the money if interest rates decrease, decrease. what's been what's happening yeah you still could money. yeah so when you come and you want to say but you know what guys um i have entered into this swap for five years at seven and a half percent and lo and behold have something bad in the economy happens and rates drop even further yeah rates go to six percent you don't take advantage you, of this. Yes. You, yeah, you don't yeah. get to benefit in that. Yeah. But then I come and I say, but I want to get out of this hedge. You have to remember a hedge is a contract and it has a mark to market. Yeah. So now there's a the cost earth. to unwind yes. the hedge. And that ties back to why you'll find a lot of the big institutional funders or the bank or the property players won't hedge for the full term. Yeah. Because you don't know yeah. what's going to happen yeah. over yeah. 15 yeah. years. Too, too risky. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So they might hedge for two years, yeah. for three years. Yeah. And that's really, in summary, the way to think about it. Absolutely. Remember the different instruments, fras and swaps. Yeah. Remember that you don't have to hedge the full term. Yeah. And it must all tie to your interest rate management strategy. Absolutely. So I think the answer is that you can fix your interest rates, but it's important you understand Bestand. how it works and what term and what are the risks if interest rates it's, go up or yeah. down. What do you say, Henry? So, 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 Andrew, as part of managing that, right, you don't want to hedge over the, the full 15 years. Yeah. So you no. want to be able to hedge two years, three years, yeah. or up to five years. I'd say between right. two to five years yeah. is comfortable, right? So exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because you don't know what's what no. going to happen. But what I always say is, you know, as entrepreneurs, right, yes. let's not become interest rate gurus or speculators where we want to play the interest rate game, sure. right? And we are saying, you know, when we earn the money, we now need to unwind. Yeah. Let's focus on what we know best. What we know is to be able to identify opportunities and try to get those opportunities work. Yeah. When they work, the chair on top is the hedging. Exactly, 100%. Exactly. Eh? Exactly. And I think it's finding a balance right between, remember when you're running your numbers and yes, interest rates are low at the moment, but if you run your interest rates at say 10% and the deal still makes financial sense and taking that, 
that gap we're going, we know interest rates are going to go up, but no one has that mirror ball, but we have good indications from the MPC, yes. right? Exactly. If the interest rates are going to go up. That's when you need to consult someone like Homozo. That's when you need to approach Tuff. Come speak to Henry. Give the guys a call. Contact Tuff um, and get more in-depth information if you don't if you don't quite understand. So ladies and gents, that is it for today. Um, if you have any questions, please contact Taf. Get hold of Henry Gamozzo if you want to get their contact details. Go through Taf. The email address is there for you and Taf will certainly be able to help you out. Now, are there any last comments from Henry and Gamozzo? Andrew, I cannot overemphasize the importance of serviceability of debt. Sure. Paying back that money. Let's manage our asset properly. Absolutely. And let's make sure that we pay back that money to TAF. But more importantly, right, let's all understand what is happening in the environment. Yes. Right. Let's understand the interest rate. Let's happen how COVID has impacted uh, entrepreneurs. Of course. But more importantly, you know, when it comes mm. to, uh, you know, your asset class, right, real estate yeah. has proved to be the best asset class Absolutely. In, in the world. Hands down. Hands exactly. Down. Hands down. I agree with you. And, and Andrew, the, the other thing is, you know that uh, every 10 years, your, your property value doubles. Yeah. Right. Your property value doubles. So as entrepreneurs, you are in the right industry. Yeah. Continue looking for those, those opportunities. Absolutely. In real estate. And the great thing about property, remember, there's two returns. There's your rental return, and on cash flow, yeah. and then you get your equity, get your capital growth. Exactly. Um, Homozo, what's your closing comments? What would you like to leave with the audience today? I think the main thing, which was the essence of what we wanted to relay today, is that there are different instruments to manage your interest rate exposure. There's various ways you can do it, but fundamentally, it's about limiting the risk that you don't want. So it's about limiting the risk and not speculating. Touching back to what Henry was saying, we're in the business of cash flow serviceability. Sure. So always think about that when you're setting up your interest rate management strategy. Absolutely. There we go. James, give me a half hour. There we go. Another episode done. Remember to watch out for the next episode. We bring you great speakers, great education that you need in your property investment career. So if you have any questions, you want to contact the gentleman, just contact Taft directly. The details are there for you. And we'll see you at the next episode. Thank you.